Okay, glad that you could all come to the Kelly Writer's House tonight. The format here is going to be uh, Michael Palmer reading, uh, and then without break, I'm going to do a close listening conversation with Michael that will be about half an hour. Um, and after that, we have a reception, so I hope you'll stay around. There are also copies of Michael's books, which I'm sure he'd be happy to sign after the Sphinx, his newest uh, book. And let me just start with the, that information about Michael's recent books, all from New Directions, The Laughter of the Sphinx, 2015, Thread, 2011, Company of Moths, 2005, Codes Appearing, which collects notes from Echo Lake, First Figure, and Sun, the three very central works of his, um, so from 79 to 88, and that was published in 2011. A collection of his essays, Active Boundaries, is from 2008. He lives in San Francisco, where he frequently works with the Margaret Jenkins Dance Company. When I graduated from college in 1972, shortly thereafter, I lived in uh, near Vancouver and uh, met uh, Robin Blazer. It's actually the time I was in touch with Ron Sullivan just at that same time in 1973. And uh, I guess Robin mentioned uh, Michael Palmer, this young poet he was really interested in. And I went to that library and I read The Plan of the City of O, and I was absolutely uh, knocked out um, and even overwhelmed by those poems which dealt with. Uh, philosophy, Wittgenstein and Quine, poetry, the present situation in, in a way I'd never seen before. And uh, it was some couple of years before I actually met Michael, but that started me off on a path of closely reading his work. When I would visit San Francisco, I stayed with, with, uh, with Michael and uh, he was a central part of what Bruce and I were trying to do with language. As I mentioned to him earlier in my office, when we sort of planned what would be the substance, what, what we liked, Palmer's work was fundamental to that. Um, and indeed, uh, the first section of Notes from Echo Lake was written uh, as a response to questions that we wrote. Uh, to him, so that started off an important series of his. So that echo and reflection has been central. When I got my job in Buffalo, the very first set of readings that I organized included having Michael Cum also organized in that case with um, Robert Creeley and Susan Howe, and actually you can hear those readings on Penn Sound and a lot of other recordings of, of Michael. And now, as I'm sort of toward the end of my time here at Penn, it's, it's nice to bookend it with Michael coming here to Penn remarkably for the first time. Um, many people stunned and elated by Palmer's work speak of it as being eloquent, eloquent, elegant, beautiful, ravishing, the sense of line, the sense of moral, uh, outrage, uh, combining in a kind of strange dance. I always say about that elegance that what always sort of thrilled me about the work is so much of it is detests exactly the elegance that it seems to be about. <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> and, and, and you read it with this real sense of, of poetic double consciousness, that, it, that you don't have to give up the possibilities of of the lyric and aestheticism and, and, uh, and the craft. And you don't have to buy into uh, all the baggage of beauty and, uh, and transcendence. But it's, it's a very hard, it's a tightrope act. And there's a lot of ways in which, like Philip Petit Palmer's line, is always walking this tightrope. And uh, he, as all of us, have been given a time in America which has always been dark. And he's never looked away from that darkness and that horror of American culture. 
and its distortions. But over time, he's become a central figure outside the United States. When I go outside the United States to Russia, uh, China, South America, the poet that is often mentioned to me uh, as being fundamental to the work that people are doing there is, is Michael Palmer. And uh, so I think he's, this, this combination of commitment to the art of poetry and the lyric and the connection to uh, you know, crucial historical figures from uh, the 19th and early 20th century as well as his contemporaries, together with an absolutely unexpected philosophical and aesthetic turn away from transcendental values, religious values, uh, 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 sh shallow sentimental and humanist values, is what makes the work a fundamental resource, not only for US poetry, but for poetry in the world today. And so it's my great pleasure to welcome for the first time to the Kelly Writers House, <laughs> Michael Palmer. Well, thank you very much, Kelly Writers House and Charles. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, It's wonderful to inevitably, as I begin to read these, to think of this long association with Charles, this long association with Ron, others. Uh, it gives, as, as we are suddenly the older generation, I don't know how that happened exactly, but, <laughs> um, but it was supposed to wait a while before it happened. Charles will be 43 and 2018. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Um, <laughs> um, there's a compensatory uh, richness to that anyway. Um, I'm going to start with a sequence of um, what I called elegies, but are not elegies, um, uh, some of which have been published in scattered form in the United States, and uh, I guess they were published in Dutch. Uh, I think the first full publication was in Dutch. Um, and uh, then I'll move on to uh, some poems from uh, the last collection of the Laughter of the Sphinx. Um, I've been trying to think of something besides elegy to call them since they're not elegies, but uh, I haven't been able to come up with a title, false elegies, um, truncated elegies. First elegy, singing is prohibited in this cafe. Torture is permitted in this cafe. I'll have a double thank you in three quarter time, sister. May I call you sister, you almond eyed, unsmiling in this ever changing light that cloaks the feral world. These dancers, do you know them? Do they think as they glide and spin of what is to be and what has been? Do you know their names? And if so, do their names change from earliest hours to late and day to day? Do their wounds show as they mimic the music's path? Sister, I apologize, but I must ask Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Abu Ghraib, Oradour, Terezin, Deir, Yassin, Verdi, Forkuta, Magadan, that waltz, that dance among the cafe candles, and beyond the fogged windows, the endless allay of lightning scarred trees, whispering fractured words for none to understand. All the beautiful names, sister, the infinite names roll off the tongue, innumerable as the stars that frolic in the sea. Second elegy. Sister, is it not time for us to learn to speak now that the infernal machines have captured the breathing word? Now that drones fill the sky over Santiago de Cuchuco, Central Park, and Unter den Linden, 
Is it finally too late in this welcome winter rain to cross the singing bridge to that place where memories of the future bend like cypress limbs under ancient snow? Where the plague years melt, melt away and the shrill voices of children explode from the mist with nothing but pain and praise to sing as if one and the same, like two bodies joined in a last embrace. And these cypresses, ministers of mourning, how is it we applaud them in their grace? Third elegy. The clock is a fiction, dear sister, yet we live within it, sister, its arms are ours, and the fiction is as real as a rose in the steel dust. And you will recall, dear sister, that each of us is the sum of the two preceding numbers in the talismanic series, and that this ever-expanding, radiant, and more than perfect spiral will swallow us, so said, was it Zoroaster, from a distant cliff his spider arms outstretched on the face of a death's head clock. And it is there, within the span of those arms, that we recall what we were not. We were not what we thought to be and to become, not the architects of desire, not the thieves of fire, nor gardeners, nor plumbers, nor workers in steel, only the painted puppets of parallel lives, only the uninvited guests, ghosts, at the beggar's banquet. Elegy for whom or for what? We watched the frothing tide gather time in, and it meant nothing at all to us then, or at most some spare thing that could not be freely said, a wound of salt-laced water and a gasping mouthful of sand, while deaf to those measures, which draw us together. Fourth elegy. At last, the perfect weather is unending, even as the ice storms prove unending, even as what was once eternal departs like a brief smile as we swing from life to life like sad-eyed clowns in white face and baggy pants balancing on red balloons between the simultaneous worlds, the parallel worlds we have yet to name. Sister, did the lords of war once offer you a name? Was it the same one that offered me at the point of a gun? Did we then live on telling the unspeakable tales over a thousand and one unending nights? Lift the ice and the sun to your lips, sister, and to mine, and sing the words between the lines. Fifth Elegy. O oh, body, where are you going? Body of the earth, lost double, lost copy of the body, mute body of yesterday in tomorrow's shredded cloth. O oh body, where are you going in the fog of the body, in the mist of thought, in the body of another, known or not? O oh body, have you watched the Dioscuroi dance as one body and two on the quantum tips of fire while an unsorcelled earth spins below? How many languages how many limbs are scattered along the roads of this earth? How many sounds meeting their anti-sounds? How many books burning to light the way? How many pure believers to shatter the icons of the pure believers while the ensorcelled earth spins on a turtle's back? Our jaws churn to emit a song that will retune the body, return the body, Dear silent earth, gone where? Sixth elegy. Here, sister, it can be said that goodbye means hello, 
day, night, far, near, here where the rivers run uphill and the clouds lie still and your shadow, ghost sister, emits an incendiary light. Sister, we have ridden the mute centaurs and firebirds round and round in the dark and slowly learn to spell without words, gauge the ebbs and swells of the untellable tale. Praise the infinite, nameless tellers of tales swaying from the poplar's limbs. The wind belongs to them, to us the breath, the frayed thread, the turn and return of the juggler's stolen song. Nothing to know, nothing to tell of the now and the then after all. I see the world is mad, sings Kabir, who knew neither ink nor pen as he wandered the islands of this earth where up is ever down and song has no sound. Seventh Elegy uh, begins with a, a quote from Nichita Stanescu. Again, we are ourselves no more. Our bodies, sisters, such as they are, almost touch, but transparent as they are, we pass through one another as if on the way elsewhere, uh, on the way as if. Sister, I've lost the thread and need to begin again. For days, no words have come, none to say elsewhere, none to say body, none to say begin. Sister, I saw three children hanging from a tree, their slender bodies tilting in the breeze. Why three? Did poem or war or dream place them there? Mad poem, mad war, sober dream. I saw a house of ink dark glass and Minerva's owl flying backwards towards that city with a future never to be. It's there we learned those countless lessons about falling, night falling, and the inner sky, it too falling, and the masters of doo-wop, techno, and ska, of tone row, and dice throw, and the angel-winged messengers of utopia, their showers of light and open-tuned guitars, the green dancer in her flesh-clinging mist, Flora and Kiki and Madame X, glistening Eva, fading Echo, and silently the anti-Icarus, falling among the concrete cliffs, his welcoming arms outstretched. City of conjurers and crumbling gates, mute buskers and alphabets aflame. Sister, your match perhaps that lit the paper path of names. List I found inside your eyelid that one brief afternoon, knowing no more where we begin or when we end. Eighth Elegy, Los Caballos en el Aire, the, the horses in the, in the air, in the sky. In a digital dream, or on the silver screen, invisible sister said, whenever sperm pours from my breasts, I am forced to ask, what sort of fountain is this? Child of empire, child of sarin, child of the atom, split that I am, split in half that I am in a chemical dream or on the silver screen, whenever black ink seeps from me, I am forced to ask, who has been entertained by what they have heard and what they have seen? Child of phosphorus raining upon rooftops, ancient child of the archive, its filtered light, its dust, in which desire surges and sleeps, and where the horses, los caballos of my splintered nights, los caballos en el aire, what need of earth, lift slowly through the dust, slowly rise. They have no need of time. They have the madness of horses in their eyes. They slowly rise, they encircle, they turn and return. They entertain as if the music were their own. There is no end to it. 
They have the madness of horses in their eyes, the madness of the archive where I reside. Ninth Elegy. All elegy is fragment, sings the crazed sister as she hurls wine glasses and dinner plates from her apartment window, the remains of a meal still upon them. Her clothes follow. Every figment is real, sings the naked sister, the now naked sister, contemplating the body that was, the one that is, and the one it will become. Afloat in the air, the clothes and the hours soon follow, both first and final, until none remain, neither minutes nor seconds to count out loud. And always in the air, the horses circling, prisoners of air, their songs heavy as air, light as a stone of bright quartz. They too are ensorcelled, these horses, and she watches them slowly falling. Falling, she watches them. Who hears her calling? Tenth Elegy. Sister Satan declares, Elegy is liquid, no, it is air. Sister Satan declares, when poetry reinvents itself without words, I will be first in line to listen. <laughs> declares that when sex reinvents itself without the flesh, I will be first in line to make love. Asks SS, and were I to lower myself by taking up the pen, what then? For one must lower the hand to lift the pen. SS declares, in the lost hours of night, the truth of my thoughts comes alive, only to be extinguished before day arrives. So an ocean of chemical waste has spread across my desk what to make of its beauty. Sister Satan declares, the forged elegies are home to me. We drop them from helicopters into the sea. Declares, I have hidden a rose upon my person or within, and within the rose, a homespun mourning cloak, and within that cloak, no body that you know. Sister declares, I have not spoken of my village, my underworld, the comedians and cosmologists who gather there, ecstatic and vacant-eyed, to toss now worthless coins into the river of the fathers, if that was its name, on the eighth day of each week of the 13th month of the year. I loved then the names of the trees, the holly, the copper beech, pin oak, and home oak, Ilanthus, chestnut, slippery elm, and winged elm, red maple, choke cherry, paper birch, red alder, dogwood, stone pine, Scots pine, mountain pine. Though in truth, Sister Satan admits, I can name none of them with certainty when I see them. And in truth, Sister Satan declares, the words I am using here to speak of myself, I might just as well use to speak of a tree or of a physicist undressing time by means of light, a solemn infidel like myself, ambling along the banks of the filthy Tiber under a swerving cloud of starlings at dust, dusk. There more than once have I sung the four last songs to an audience of none have sung or been sung. And if as well I celebrate too much the devil's trill, as some would claim, it is what rings in my aging ear, hands, throat, and tongue no longer my own. Sister Satan further declares that semen stain left somehow upon me lingers like the scent of hashish in a steamy room 
whose space at once expands and contracts like elegy annihilating the past. That stain shaped like the angel of history's isolate tear. While kind Sasha in Petersburg slips the eye of an almond into his mouth and sweet Elena serves us wild garlic from the mountains and passes me a forbidden cigarette with a wink. And with any luck, we confound the agents of grief. And then there's this footnote, Rome, St. Petersburg, Rome, November 2015. So uh, my wife Kathy and I were in residency at the uh, Americana Academy in Room. Actually, she was in residency. I was oh, came along, and uh, I did much of the work on the elegies there while writing a piece to a, a an essay, a talk to give in St. Petersburg uh, <coughs> at the. Um, um, At a, at a festival celebrating young poets, um, Arkady Dragomenko awards ceremonies. It was the second one. And uh, so I reference Arkady occasionally in here, along with Sasha, who is Sasha Skidan, wonderful poet, um, and uh, wrote them in Rome, and then a bit of work on them in St. Petersburg, and then finished them back in Rome. Here's the opening poem in uh, The Laughter of the Sphinx. By permission of the sun, the arctic chill descends. In a teacup a storm, in a sentence, the logician's fate and poetry an enemy of the state of things. By the roadside in a ditch or beneath a buckled bridge. Now it is our wounds that make love in the streets, wounds hastily dressed with vetiver and mint while slender poplars bend amidst the violent winds. What is your name, mindless son? What idiot song will mark your end? This is called Let Us Ravel the Silence. And uh, it was uh, part of a, a collaboration with a, a painter uh, uh, named Irving Petlin, and a painter and pastel artist. And so I refer to chalk at the end, refer, referencing uh, pastel. Let us ravel the silence, its pages turning. It is a hum, after all of no sound, a buzz of absent bees, a swirl of sky licked by flame and a waste of sea, reeds bending east towards a tentative shore, scatter song of light's passage across a curving earth. There is a bridge in the bare distance. It is a bridge between silences, bridge of steel where once the emperor's dragon was meant to pass, bearing the palaces of the gods on its back brows furled over blazing eyes, scales of gold counting, coating the torso, and always the stones at sea bottom like extinguished stars. The sun here neither rises nor sets, does chalk emit a breath. Uh, this is for Laszlo, it's titled For Laszlo K and uh, uh, meaning Laszlo Krasnorke, the, the, the great Hungarian oh, novelist and uh, screenwriter. The characters are the victims of the novel. They pay with their lives for our words. They fall between the pages in their silence and we invent Pounds to devour them. We invent worlds to swallow them. We pass sentence upon them. The hangman arrives with his silken rope, its infinite strands forming a circle without beginning or end, round as the wave's gray eye, rolling toward what sudden shore 
unpeopled, yet teeming with watchful night fires. The laughter of the Sphinx. The laughter of the Sphinx caused my eyes to bleed. The blood from my eyes flowed onto that ancient map of sand. Ridiculous as I am, often have I been drawn to such lands, rippling oceans of silence and a distant enigmatic glow of burning shops and burning scrolls, overseen by river birds and mitered beasts, sad-eyed scholars and mournful scribes, omniscient ibises, and in the dust-clogged air, the laughter of the Sphinx, endlessly riddling, endlessly echoing, loosing the blood's engulfing tide. Isle of Dogs. Which is an island in the Thames. On the Isle of Dogs, we barked. We had our say from day till dark. A chorus we were of piebald hounds. Our howling spiraled out across the downs. We howled at the redness of light, bayed at the rising waters and approaching night. We lived on an island of sounds. None listened, none heard. The sounds were entirely ours. None listened, none heard, but we didn't care as long as our howls shaped the still air. We lived on the Isle of Sounds. Tomb of Aimé Césaire. Uh, this was written shortly after Césaire's death. At, what, a hundred years old or something like that. I mourned a person who turned out not to be dead. Of that, what is to be said? Surgical noise of the city, sentence and song under earth. I wept for something lost, a dog or a dusk or a thought. A thing that couldn't be bought. Sun throat cut, woman removing a glove. And the body at once naked and veiled, waiting and waiting for what? Coma, Berenices above the bay, sea rack beneath, speech of the bone, and of the polychrome wing, speech of the leaf descending and of the rubble in a ruined field. Words have their lives apart. I mourned a person who turned out not to have died beneath a feral sky and a flooded shore where a wave was frozen in midair. storm. Basho by my bedside these many years. Little wonder the roof is leaking. It was true. I remember, you remember the drips. Yep. <laughs> uh. This is called In Memory of Ivan Cherepnin. Uh, Ivan was a, a wonderful, quite radical composer who I was in, uh, at Harvard with, and we became very friendly. And uh, at one point, uh, he took me to his, uh, 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 his parents owned a very elegant uh, studio in Paris uh, in the uh, sixth arrondissement, I guess it was, uh, that had been a studio of Delacroix. And uh, um, Ivan came from this family. His, his grandfather had been a, uh, 
famous neoclassical composer, uh, had worked with dance. His father, likewise, in Russia, had been a uh, also somewhat conservative neoclassical composer who had worked with ballet. And Ivan and his brother were two absolutely crazy uh, contemporary composers um, and uh, wonderful. But this, uh, in part, uh, so I read about Ivan's death. We had lost contact with one another. And uh, I read about his death in the context of his son, who also had become a composer. In the New York Times, there was an article about how his son was uh, composing works with the body as an instrument, striking the body and electric, electronically modifying the body and this and that. Uh, so it brought Ivan to mind uh, and our, our walks through Paris when I was in my late teens, early 20s. In memory of Ivan Cheroknin, so many sounds flower, but they are not flowers. They are mangled girders in a field, a field of flowers, echo of hooves, heavy metal of tanks, music's lost memory. In the enveloping mist, our shoes squealing upon the paving stones while winding through your Paris streets. Which one of us said the absolute secret of art lies in the tongue of a shoe? Who said the true secret of art resides in the gaze of a cat? And that's that. Which one of us asked, is this the buried sound of the future past? Do electrons still sing when no one is listening? A little stoned, perhaps. We spoke of corpses waving batons, hierophants professing poems, as the mist cloaked our words and midsummer night measure by measure finally arrived. Ivan Alexandrovich, is it only the fugitive things that ravel the, the cells and ring through the air? Le va et le vient, as you put it. The slow rise of a half step, followed by falling semitones in a day of one birth and one death. So many sounds flower, but they are not flowers. They are street calls and cries and the promises of bone and the bright, sightless eye at the flower's brief heart. Um, this is a poem after a, uh, um, I, I, I was asked by some people in uh, Belgium, uh, I don't have a list, it was, uh, to uh, contribute to a, uh, a kind of collaboration, if you will, with Anish Kapoor for a piece of his, a sculpture called The Mountain. And uh, um, this is the uh, piece I wrote. A dream of sound inside the mountain after Anish Kapoor. It is too brief, this life inside the mountain where headless horsemen sing fevered songs of self and war. When did we first notice the trees of mottled bone? When first hear the cawing of crows, contention of the orchard orioles, the sleepers echoing cries, rehearsing their final words, resisting final dreams? These dreams were mine and not mine, say the walls of stone walls of the poem. Hedge crickets sing, <laughs> and the white whale, its whiteness sings in the stone dream, and the lost hours have each their silent song. In the heat of bee time and the shock of desire, those times when time is not, and the endlessly shifting stones carefully speak, and rain floods the rutted roads, it is too long this spiral life, it is too brief, how the wind and light pass through our bodies of glass. Uh, the uh, Hedge Cricket Sing, of course, is a quotation from Keats, but um, it's a sort of double quotation because Louis, Louis Zukowski did an anthology of um, fragments uh, and of poems and fragments that he approved of. 
And, <laughs> and Louis' approval was hard to come by, particularly for Keats. And I think Hedge Cricket Sing was the only quote he did from Keats that he thought was austere and <coughs> precise enough to belong in Louis' anthology. Uh, At the tomb of Artaud. At the tomb of Artaud, wherever it may be, we hear a howl, unmistakable, the howl of a wounded wolf gnawing at its foreleg, caught in the teeth of a hunter's steel trap. At the tomb of Artaud, wherever it may be, a sleeper and his double throw dice made of bone. Should the dice fall just so, they explain, it will snow on the tomb of our toe. Should they fall otherwise, the earth will be dry. A dancer and her double make love on the bright stones, the light bringers, by the tomb of our toe that has become a book of stone they care not to read, whatever it may mean, as the fitful iridescent dragonflies alight on the wet heat of their bodies. Only later will they piss on his grave as a clock without hands applauds in the dark. I was working on that poem and I sort of got a visitation from Marteau and he said, don't make that one too sweet. Uh, uh, and so those last four lines uh, about pissing on the grave were in honor of our tool, his intervention. Ah, well, I want this is uh, for Zina Dagomoshenko. Um, and it's got, uh, it's a sort of triply referential thing. Um, uh, Arkady Dragomashenko, the great poet who died some years back, who I mentioned before, uh, had, a, had a book published in uh, English called Endarkenment, uh, as in, in op opposite of enlightenment. Um, and, uh, it, this references, um, in part, Arkady's uh, uh, a scene from his childhood at the end, but also his relationship to Lynn Hedginian and uh, so on. To X, parentheses, and darkenment. Who is the night creature that devoured the clover? Who the mathematician who first solved to X? The child lost in the house, in the dark corridors of the house, endless corridors of the house, what child, what house? Those blood-red nasturtiums, I planted them for Arkady when I heard of his death, having forgotten that I was not, not ever in this echoic life to mention death, either of the self or the other, the particle or the page, curled at its edges by what random flame. It is no match for the flame to which the lovers are consigned, no match for the wind that feeds the flame, no match for the fate of the earth at our hands. It is complex, the mathematics of lovers, where one plus one equals what? And the lost child, for who was not once the lost child and who will not become so again. By the river of the fathers, we often gathered as kids. It stank of chemicals and shit, not the river's fault, not your fault, not mine, a sacred baptismal river, Arkady. Your book has arrived, though you've suddenly left. How are we doing? Okay. A late, a late supper. In a digital dream, it is always one in the morning. 
Oscar Yorn and my father sit at the dining room table discussing hotel management with Marcel Duchamp, who has just coined the phrase, dinner is not served. <laughs> Salt cellar, pepper grinder, candles, the roasted head of a goat and a vintage bottle of red from Ceausescu's private stash, liberated upon his death. My pen, my pen is leaking ink, Nikolai, and these flowers are wilting, though freshly cut. Cavafi would approve, I suspect, of the flowers, if not the goat, were he here now, but he never leaves his room. The, uh, the bottle of red wine that I refer to uh, and, and Ceausescu, I, I, a book of mine was being published in Denmark in 1994, and uh, there was a, a, um, a celebration uh, at the publishers, uh, who was also an art dealer, um, of the book, and I gave a reading. And um, uh, afterwards, the uh, publisher came up to me and said, uh, do you like wine? I said, yes, I do. And she presented me with a bottle of uh, Romanian red wine that had been liberated from Nicolae Ceausescu's cellar upon his death. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> at the hands of his government. Hmm? At the hands of his government. Many people. I, I don't know who actually uh, pulled the trigger or whatever. <laughs> but yes. Uh, um, uh, and uh, it was a classic bottle. Romania, of course, has an ancient history of wine growing, possibly from the Roman times, the Roman invasion or before. And it was a beautiful bottle of a semi-dry, characteristic semi-dry wine that we drank maybe two years later in a hand-blown bottle. <laughs> Things you need to know about poetry. <laughs> I'll read a few more. Falling Down in America. Every three seconds, someone over 30, oh, every, ah. every three seconds, someone over 65 falls down in America. Our records show that you are over 65 and may therefore have already fallen down in America, maybe more than once. Perhaps upon entering your bath, you slipped and cracked open your skull and subsequently drowned in a pool of blood. If so, disregard this notice. Perhaps, <laughs> While gazing at the sea distractedly one day, your balance failed, and the waves carried you away toward the irradiated swells of Fukushima. If so, never mind. The flesh has already peeled from your limbs, and your eyes have melted in their sockets, in which case you should disregard this notice. We need hardly remind you that many of your friends and relatives, perhaps beloved uncles, aunts, cousins, your seven brothers and sisters, parents assuredly may have succumbed in some manner to the fateful equation of gravity and age. In addition, it is likely that your investments recently caved and as a result from the shock you fainted upon the cheap Mexican tiles of your dining room floor and days later awoke among impersonal professionals masked and clad in white and addressing you as if you were a child. If so, you now know that you are utterly alone in this life. Please favor us with a reply regarding our one-time offer, which will soon expire. <laughs> it was the time I started getting these phone calls. Uh, let's see, how are we? A couple more. Et in, Arca et in Arcadia. <clears throat> it rained frogs. We were the frogs and the rain. As the planets fled their orbits, apples ripened in the orchards to our north. We bit into the planets as if they were apples. They crackled beneath our teeth and their juices streamed off our jowls like syllables from childhood. Our mad brothers, mad lovers, mad others were already gone. 
The bees and their hexagons, their dances were gone, the whales and their songs. Shoeless, we walked across the stellated, the glowing, irradiated meadows of glass. Have you always had this tremor, she asked. Yes. Uh, maybe I'll finish with it. After. And to write a poem beneath a sickle moon is barbaric. And to write a... P no, let me start over. And to write a poem beneath a sickle moon is barbaric. And to trace a poem upon the lover's body is barbaric. And to write a poem amidst the dust, amidst the dust storm of history is barbaric. And to read a poem, to read while the book is burning, and to enter the paper house while the streets are burning, to enter the paper house which is silent, and to hear the song, should we call it a song soonest gone, of the cicadas in the parching heat, when to drink of the lover's liquid is barbaric, and to wander in a dark wood, wander lost in a dark wood, to look and to begin to say farewell, to begin and to dwell, to dwell upon, to dwell among. Thank you. Thank you so much for that reading. Are you ready to go? Take a minute. I'm okay. Okay.